Report Black Masculinist News for the day. Hope everybody's well. Um, this is a su subscriber requested review, so uh, I thought let me go ahead and get this in. I will um, have to edit it after it goes up, but the full version will be made available on Patreon if you want to see it after the live broadcast. Either way, um, like, share, subscribe, join, and donate. Support the show so we can continue to bring you this independent black male thought. But as you can see, we're going to be reviewing Transformers Rise of the Beasts. Uh, there are spoilers, so if you're not interested in spoilers, you might want to check out until you see the film itself. But I also want to start out by thanking everybody for supporting, um, you know, my son's graduation last week. It's much appreciated. Got a lot of love. Uh, so I let him know that and he was kind of he was real cool with that. So much appreciated. Uh, actually, because of one of my subscribers, shout out to uh, Ace Butterfly. I was able to get him some size 20 dress shoes. The unfortunate thing is they showed up to my doorstep an hour after we had to leave for the graduation, but it was what it was. So we got it in, he enjoyed it. And now he got some dress shoes for the next number of years because I ain't gonna be able to find them again readily. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so, you know, Transformers Rise of the Beast. I went to see this, uh, you know, my son and I, I bought tickets for what, a week or two ago. And I didn't realize at that time it was the day after his graduation. So uh, the day after the family requested that I do a brunch. So I was up cooking from seven in the morning uh, to when folks got there close to noon. So by the time we went to them see the movie that night, I was pretty wiped out. Um, and I will admit I, I, I dipped. I fell asleep a few times. I don't know if that was strictly my uh, exhaustion or if it was the film itself, but you know, I didn't sleep for long periods. They were like micro naps. <laughs> I will say, you know, I will say before that happened and when I was awake, I wasn't thrilled. This was not my favorite Transformer movie. Um, Michael Bay is not directing, but he's still producing. So he's still in there. And I think, you know, Bay is not the best thing for this, you know, series. But I will give credit where credit is due. The very first Transformers movie that they did, I, I really enjoyed and Bumblebee. I thought was great as a G1 advocate. I'm Gen X, so G1 is gonna be my standard for it. Um, you know, so I appreciated that. You had a lot of high, uh, you know, yeah, quality voice actors involved with this. Of course, they brought back Peter Cullen as Optimus Prime and appropri appropriately so. You had Ron Perlman in there uh, as Optimus Primal. Peter Dinklage was there, Michelle Yao. Um, Pete Davidson, who we're gonna get to in a minute as far as Barrage. Uh, John DiMaggio, um, Coleman Domingo played Unicron, um, you know, not a lot of, you know, fair, fair, a fair number of big names involved. So, you know, they did their thing as far as that. Um, but I will say in terms of this whole process, obviously one of the major characters or the central character beyond Optimus, as far as the Transformers were concerned was uh, Mirage, you know, um, now these are uh, a number of the uh, uh, the new Transformers brought in, especially the animal ones. Well, they only there's only two here. There are more. I think you can see in the initial picture I posted some of them up there. You got the uh, you know you got the hawk, you got the rhino, you got the cheetah, you got the gorilla, you know um, Optimus Primal, Scourge, Air Razor, uh, RC. I uh, was in the other picture, Rhinox. You know a number of characters. They even brought in Nightbird, which is a character from one of the G1 cartoons. She was actually human made, so I was surprised to see her as an actual Transformer. So that was interesting. Um, this middle brownish character is actually uh, supposed to be Wheeljack. And even though the glasses don't make any logical sense, I thought they were a dope addition, but this is not Wheeljack as far as I'm concerned. So I wasn't particularly thrilled with their rendition. RC is dope, you know, it was good to see her. 
Um, I don't think they still explain gender on <laughs> on Cybertron, so I don't know about all of that, but it was good to, you know, kind of see her character in there. Um, but, you know, here's a clip so you can actually check out uh, how they kind of centered this around one character. Fun, man. You're fun, dude. Back up. Hey, whoa, whoa. I thought after the car chase, we were boys. The name's Mirage. Come on. Give me a little, give me a little tap. You've never faced anything like this. I'm blowing up like you thought I would. Call the clip, same number, same hood. It's all good. Oh, uh, yeah. Relax. I'm Mirage, remember? And if you won't know, now you know. One, two, three. Transformers, Rise of the Beasts. Okay. So, you can kind of see that they based a lot of this around Mirage, which is actually kind of strange um, in a way because Mirage, all right. I don't know how much they're connecting this to the previous universe, especially since Michael Bay is still producing. I, you know, I, I thought this was the same universe, but they went back a few years and did some prequels. Some have argued they're not connected at all. I'm not really sure, but uh, Jazz uh, was, was a central character and they kind of based a lot of this or a good portion of it on Jazz. And they kind of made him, made Mirage more like what Jazz kind of was. It's a little confusing, but uh, Jazz's character, is, you know, is not here. And I'll, I'll cover a little bit of that in a second. So this one is played by Peter Davidson or Pete Davidson from Saturday Night Live fame. Um, you know, eh, I'm not really a Pete Davidson fan. There was nothing that he said that really made me laugh per se. But the character Mirage kind of confused me in this. And so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that um in a second so all right so if mirage let me see if i can pull it up on the screen here because this is uh, this was not what i was expecting i noticed the porsche you know in the uh you know in the in the trailer when i first saw it and i was kind of like that's real strange because that's actually what jazz is and jazz was my favorite character as a kid he was actually the first transformer i ever got so I'm very particular about how jazz is used, right? But here you, here you go. So this is a website uh, that deals, Heroes Wiki, deals with Mirage uh, Generation 1. You can see an image of him there. They showed a quick glimpse of it when they were, when he was kind of just projecting different images. He's actually a Formula One racing car in the original G1, which, you know, it makes sense he's not driving around New York as a Formula One car, but then again, the Transformers never made sense in terms of that. They were what they were and they drove around how they drove around regardless of what they transformed into. But nevertheless, uh, as you can see here, Mirage is uh, is his own character, you know. Um, let's see uh, what can be said about him. Mirage is an Autobot scout with the Formula One racing car alternate mode in the Transformers franchise. Mirage was raised as a member of the upper class the Transformers franchise. When the war broke out, he joined the Autobots although he is often unsure about his motivations for doing so, which leaves his fellow Autobots finding it hard to trust him, a problem not helped by the fact that Mirage can rarely hide that he is often unwilling to fight directly, or his contempt for the commoners he is now forced to interact with. He has no lost love for Earth, and would happily return to his old life on Cybertron if he could. It is ironic that he Okay, so you get, the, you get the crux of it right there. Mirage is a character and if you watch the old G1 cartoon, you kind of got a little of this. You didn't really get the whole upper class, you know, elitism necessarily. The way it came across is he was shy and withdrawn. You know, he was kind of removed. Um, he had the ability to turn invisible. He could project, uh, you know, holograms, images, uh, you know, things like that that confuse his opponents. Um, he was, you know, he was a, a good fighter, but he didn't talk very much. And he wasn't actually one of the, you know, the more congenial you know kind of characters to get along with that wasn't how he got down so when i'm looking at this character that they're showing in the movie high energy interactive funny all of that i'm like that's not mirage now it's not exactly jazz but more so jazz than mirage um and i remember this 
because as a kid, when I was first introduced to Transformers, um, oh my God, I can't even remember what age I was, but when I was first introduced to Transformers, um, my grandmother actually got me my first one. Now there's a Mirage there. That's the Formula One racing car. That's how, what he looked like in his robot mode, you know? So I never had him as a character, not until years later, just as a collector piece, but I wanted him, but you know, some of those I never even saw in the store. And if I did a lot of time, we didn't have the money anyway. Um, but this is what he was uh, in the movie, right? This is what Mirage was, but he was supposed to be a Formula One racing car. He ended up kind of being this Porsche. Now, it didn't bother me that he was a Porsche, but the style of Porsche he was clearly was a call out to Jazz because this is actually Jazz's, uh, you know, mode as it looked when he was a Porsche. Very similar. You know, there you got an image of Jazz. You know. Now, the reason this jazz stuck out to me and resonated with me as a kid was because again, my grandmother, uh, was, that was the first transformer I ever got. She bought for me, which was interesting because I'm sitting with my son and my father watching this movie and my father, you know, I'm telling him, you know, cause he's looking at this, like, I don't know what any of this is. And I don't, you know, I'm just here because my son and my grandson are here. But I told him, I said, no, grandmother, that's the first toy she brought me or it's based off of that. And he lost it. He was like, what? You know, so it was nice. Nice little moment going back to the early 80s. But the other thing that made Jazz even more, you know, a character I liked when I was a kid is when they finally started the cartoon, there was a familiarity to his voice that resonated with me. Now, I didn't know uh, Scatman Crothers by name, but I remembered him from The Shining. I remembered him from the Twilight Zone movie. I'm, you know, I even saw him in an episode of um, Sanford and Son, but I'm not going to say I knew his whole career. I was a kid. You know, I even remember him from a movie called Zapped uh, with um, uh, the kid who played in Happy Days, um, Chachi or whatever. Uh, so I remember seeing Scatman. He was all over the place in the 70s. He was in a lot of stuff. And so his voice resonated with me. It just didn't register that he would be doing a kid's cartoon. But sure enough, he was jazz. And in my mind, this made him the first black Transformer. And so I kind of had a resonance frame. I had a thing for jazz and I was happy. He was my first, uh, you know, character. So, you know, again, when I saw the first trailer for this, I'm like, I, because I remember even the, the first 2007 transformer, you know, live action movie, I didn't like their rendition of jazz. And so, you know, I was glad to see a nod to the G1 jazz, but you know, it, the way they went about it, I wasn't thrilled with, but there were a number of, of black characters that I just kind of briefly want to point out before I get back to the movie. Right. There were other black transformers. This was Buster Jones playing as Blaster, right? Blaster was, uh, you know, direct, uh, uh, enemy to sound wave. One of the most popular, uh, transformers there is, especially because of his voice. But Buster Jones was also known as Edward L. Jones, right? Born 1943, died in 2014, right? So this brother was best known for his roles as black Vulcan in super friends. Uh, Blaster and Transformers, Doc in G.I. Joe, a real American hero, and Winston Zedmore in the real Ghostbusters after he replaced Arsenio Hall, and later the extreme Ghostbusters. Uh, born in Paris, Texas, attended Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee, where he played in the band, got a job as a DJ. Uh, during that career, he worked in D.C. and in L.A., did voice work on commercials, so on and so forth. All right, appears as the host of Soul Unlimited, Dick Clark's short-lived all-black version of American Bandstand that they tried to use to compete with Soul Train um, and um, provided voices for Defenders of the Earth, Super Globetrotters, Captain Planet and the Planeteers, New Batman Adventures. Um, but like I said, he died at the age of 70 in 2014. So that's Buster Jones. Um, and again, when I first saw Blaster, I knew it was a brother just in the voice. I didn't know who Buster Jones was, but I knew it was a brother. Right, and that's him in his stereo mode, his, his boombox mode, right? That was another character I had. But this was the 2007 Jazz, voiced by Darius McCrary. I wasn't thrilled. Um, I mean, I don't dislike Darius McCrary by any means. I mean, I was never really into his career. I didn't really watch, um, you know, the shows he was in, but I didn't dislike him. I just didn't like this rendition of Jazz. Again, I wanted the Porsche. Right. So this this thing that they were probably you know, selling or whatever, I wasn't thrilled in his robot mode. 
except for the eye visor and maybe the chest lights, it had nothing in common with the jazz I grew up with. And Darius kind of gave him kind of a hip hop voice. You know, he's, he's kind of had this uh, street brother kind of tone, which wasn't jazz. So again, I wasn't particularly thrilled with this rendition, but you know, no disrespect to McCrary. Um, but there were others, right? You know, there were a whole kind of treasure trove of black voice artists that I didn't know about that were around. So Earl Hyman played, um, you know, Panthro and Thundercats. And I had this affinity for him as well, but I didn't know why. I, it, it never dawned on me that the grandfather from Cosby Show would do a voice in a kid's cartoon. Again, never thought of that connection would make any sense. That's like Roscoe Lee Brown, you know, these, these, these really, uh, these black performers that had decades of experience it never dawned on me that these cats would be doing you know cartoons so even though i'm watching cosby show and thundercats at the same time there's it just doesn't make sense because i'm not picturing grandpa as the strongest and black thundercat right so uh, there was a lot of those kind of things that you know kind of had resonance for me as far as that's concerned right so you had earl hyman um you know uh, Check into that brother's career, a long history in African-American theater, stage actor. He actually passed away at the age of 91 in 2017. So just a few, just about six years ago, he passed. But shout out to him, you know, um, you know, keeping that legacy alive. And just real quick, I'm going to put a link. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Oh, uh, where'd it go? Here we go. Ah, all right. That is not... How it should be but anyway i'm going to put a link up because there is a web page that kind of gives credence to some of these artists um most particularly from um let's see if this will work see, there we go it's a little bit better not particularly great but some of these artists um who again have had extensive careers but have not been fully recognized uh, for years at a time. Uh, it kind of blew me away. I tripped up on this page. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but like I said, I'm going to put the link in the description box for anyone who's interested because there's a long legacy of black actors, uh, performers who, who actually did a lot of voice work for animation. And I recently did a post on Facebook really shouting out some of my favorites like Phil Lamar, Keith David, who did Phil Lamar, who did a million things, but Samurai Jack, Keith David, David, whose, you know, performance in Spawn, the animated Spawn was just ridiculous. You know, so there are a lot of my favorite voice actors. And I would say the brother who's doing Miles Morales right now in Spider-Verse is actually one of my favorites as well. He really captures a 15 year old uh, black kid in New York, you know, um, so I think he did a real good job. Well, you know, kind of a nerdy black kid in New York, you know, so I like it. Scatman Crothers, as you can see right here, alongside Buster Jones, Arthur Burkhart, who plays Devastator in the G1 cartoon, right? Not a brother I'm familiar with, but some of these I've seen before. So you got Blue Mankuma plays Tigatron. Now I'm not particularly familiar with that rendition of Transformers, but I remember that brother from, um, oh goodness, what is the movie? It was just on yesterday. Um, movie about the whole world shifting all around, millions die, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna remember it, but some of you, in the in the uh comments will um nevertheless he was in that film but you know you got keith diamond you got alvin sanders playing different transformer characters right there goes keith david who actually played barricade in the video games in the movie verse i guess doran bell darius mccrary that has jazz you know bumper robinson who I've, I've liked a lot in a lot of different things you know played in, the, in there Cree summers Cree summer excuse me uh, Phil Lamar again, you know, so, you know, you can see a long legacy and these are some of the some of the quality ones Reno Wilson Tony Todd is ridiculous. His voice is just crazy um, You know, but you got a lot of these characters. I like Kevin Michael Richardson. I didn't know Dwayne Johnson pre played uh, Cliff Jumper in Prime You know got Gina Torres, you know, so you got a lot of uh, legacy of black actors Ernie Hudson You know what I mean? So I, you know, like I said, you could check this out LeVar Burton a lot of them have played in these that we kind of overlook and don't know about. I didn't know Jack A. Harris or Harry, excuse me, Jack A. Harry was playing uh, in Robots in Disguise. You know what I mean? So Gary Anthony, remember him from a number of different things. Uh, Harry Lennox. Oh, my God. Played in uh, as Cyclonus. That's powerful.
right? You got Michael Dorn, you know, in there as well. So there's a long list. Check it out if you get a chance. Um, yeah, so you can see them there. Sorry, I didn't have that on the screen just now, but you can see how many of these actors have played in the Transformer series. And that's not even just dealing with animation and voice work. That's just Transformers, right? So there's a long legacy of black actors, some of whom, you know, their careers started back in the 20s and 30s in terms of entertainment that are involved in this. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, that I geek out on from time to time. And I pay attention to when it comes to series like these. First up he is. Okay. Let's get out of here real quick. All right. So got a few of those in. And I just kind of wanted to highlight that for the quick for a quick second. But back to the review. So basically, uh, the story uh, for the film, you know, um, Rise of the Beast, a little convoluted. I didn't think it was quite as smooth. Uh, as it could have been uh, a little all over the place. It, it struck me as one of those movies that, you know, they wanted to do a bunch of cool effects and then they tried to cram in a story. Whereas if you watch Spider-Verse, you get a story that's so interweaved with the animation and the animation is so creative that you get lost in both. In this, they had some cool special effects, but I wasn't particularly impressed with the story. I can say too, I didn't, you know, I didn't watch Beast Wars. I tried to. But I think by the time it came out, I kind of moved on in a particular way. I'm, I'm a G1, you know, Transformers, uh, you know, person. So Beast Wars did not appeal to me at all. I really wasn't interested in seeing, you know, robots be dinosaurs and animals. So it didn't appeal to me then. It still didn't appeal to me now. Uh, even though I appreciate, you know, the technical skill in the animation, I, I wasn't particularly impressed with that side of things. Um, you know, I will say Dominique Fishback and Luna uh, Velez kind of stood out to me. Uh, Dominique, I've seen her in a number of things. She played Elena Wallace. Um, uh, she was, you know, she was one of the central characters in the film. She did a really good job with Samuel L. Jackson in a film uh, they did together on Blanking On. I wasn't actually planning to bring that up, but if you can look up, let me see, I'm gonna do, because the name is on the tip of my tongue. And I think I've talked about it um, in other projects. She's acted with Jamie Foxx. Um, she's been in a number of things. Oh, The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray with Samuel L. Jackson. Excellent film. If you ever get a chance to check it, they did a beautiful job. She acted pretty well in that. Um, you know, uh, playing a caretaker to Samuel Jackson. She did, uh, what's the other one she did with Jamie Foxx? Uh, Project Power, yeah. That's where I remember seeing her in that. So, you know, she did some interesting character work. Her career's coming along well. Luna Velez, who also plays in Spider-Verse as Miles' mother. Um, you know, um, I didn't really have her picture prepared to be up. I didn't think I'd be talking about her, but you know, uh, she did a sound job, you know, playing the main character's mother. Um, but that's not where I was introduced to her. I was introduced to her through New York Undercover. So that was the first place I'd ever seen her. Be familiar with Luna Velez, uh, Luna Velez, or Lauren Velez here, which is strange because uh, they have her as yes, Luna Lauren Velez here. So anyway, um, she does well. You know, I didn't have any problems with her performance necessarily. Anthony Ramos, I'm new to. You guys may, might be more familiar with him from other things. Um, you know, he didn't do a bad job. I wasn't particularly impressed, but I wasn't, you know, upset. He did what he was there to do. Um, I guess he was in Hamilton. That's probably why I'm not familiar. And one of the reasons he got the part, I've never seen Hamilton, wasn't really drawn to. But I'm sure that had a lot to do with him getting kind of a... Uh, you know, the lead role in that respect. But um, anyway, like I said, I don't have anything against them. No negative, nothing negative to say, um, you know, but it was okay that, you know, the human characters were, you know, just kind of, eh. Um, I will say I've never seen, there's two characters in this that I've never quite seen represented this way. And, and I, you know, I, I applaud the creativity, but I, did, I didn't particularly think it came off well uh, for me anyway. And uh, I think the first one is Unicron. Right. So Unicron 
is actually voiced by Coleman Domingo, who's going to be playing Mr. in this upcoming rendition of The Color Purple. But he's been in a lot of stuff um, as an actor. I've liked Coleman's work in the past. I'm not thrilled about, you know, The Color Purple role, but, you know, he's been in Selma, Fear of the Walking Dead. Uh, he's been in a lot of stuff. Um, you know, Candyman. You know, just saw him in that not too, uh, but a couple years ago. He's in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which was an excellent film. A good send off uh, to our good brother from Black Panther fame, who I'm still, you know, a little sad whenever I think about the brother Chadwick Boseman not being here anymore. Uh, but uh, they both played excellent in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Again, if you haven't seen it, something you might want to go check out. But yeah, but Coleman, you know, he played Unicron and it wasn't his performance at all. You know, his voice work was adequate. Uh, just, you, I've never really seen Unicron like this. He's like a space worm eating planets. That's not the Unicron. Again, I'm G1. If you go back to the old, you know, Transformers, the movie, that's the Unicron I'm used to. He's a planet uh, rolling around um, and he can transform into a robot, that whole kind of thing. They kind of, and they hinted at him in the last Transformers series, which was technically in the future if these universes are connected and they suggest he's somehow part of the core of the earth whereas in this series he can't even get to earth and the whole quest is to keep him from coming to earth so that's kind of what this whole movie is about to prevent the end of the world uh if unicron gets access to earth and he'll destroy the planet so you know they're fighting to make sure that nobody can inadvertently bring him here and there's a crew of Transformers that are trying to do so. And, you know, the Autobots are fighting against them to do it alongside, um, you know, the uh, animal Transformers. But the other character that didn't resonate as well uh, was uh, Peter Cullen's Optimus. Now, I'm not sure if they're saying that this was a stage Optimus went through before he became the Optimus we know. But, you know, in this particular series, Optimus is... He's not really a, 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 they said he was a legend, but I, I don't think he really achieved that level yet. He, he had a kind of a disdain for humans almost, you know, which is not Optimus. You know, he had a kind of negative kind of vibe about him. He was down, he, you know, he was eh, not the Optimus that, that, you know, those of us grew up on. You know, I could deal with it in terms of, you know, looking at this as a stage that helps him become the Optimus that, you know, most of us love, you know, that, that motivates others, inspires others around him. It was kind of hard watching him be this kind of down negative character in a way I wasn't familiar with. But, you know, it didn't destroy the story for me. It was just different. It was it was something I wasn't expecting. Um, it wasn't particularly bad or good to me, but. You know, it is what it is. And I know they got to shake it up sometimes because Optimus can become a little stale as the stalwart hero. So I, I understand they got to flip it up from time to time. But this particular rendition wasn't particularly exciting to me, you know, but I keep saying maybe they did something completely dope in one of my micro naps. But anyway, you know, you guys tell me those of you who saw the film, you know, feel free to comment. Let me know what I got wrong. Let me know what you liked. Let me know, you know, what what you thought had. Uh, was well done or what could have been done better you know but for the most part i would say i would wait till cable or not kind of calling it cable it's dating myself but i would wait to see it uh, at home i you know of course you know when it is as a new film you know my son and i go see a number of films together transformer series is one of them so um we always going to go sit in the theater and kind of check it out They've been, in my opinion, they've been getting better since Bumblebee, but this one, I hope this is not an indication of where it's going. I hope it's just, you know, a middle story that ends up getting better on the latter end. So we'll see, but not a lot to say beyond that. Um, you know, the story was kind of disjointed to me. It wasn't really coherent. Um, there was a nice little Easter egg toward the end, tying in a, the G1 Transformer era to uh, G.I. Joe which was interesting. The potential of it could be interesting because I think for a lot of us who grew up at that time period, there was an already implicit connection, not because in the comic books they connected the two overtly, which they did, but because most of us were watching Transformers after school and GI Joe came on right alongside Transformers. So for us, there was kind of this sense that they were always connected anyway. And, you know, it was just, we didn't get to see them interact very much, but 
you know, uh, in popular culture, but we kind of always thought there was some kind of an implicit link in one way or another. Like if one showed up in the other, it really wasn't going to be an earth shattering revelation. It would be, it would have fit because of our familiarity with the two, um, you know, properties uh, as it were. So, you know, seeing the implication of that raised in this film. Yeah. If they do some other films and they tie it in a little bit more, it could be good. could be interesting because in my opinion, they've never gotten GI Joe quite right in the live action films. But again, my standard for that are the 80s cartoons. And believe it or not, I wasn't particularly a fan of GI Joe at that time. I like Thundercats. I like T-Man. I like Transformers. When GI Joe came on, eh, that was like one step, but you know, that was like the last show before there were no more cartoons after school and they were going to start playing the news and things of that nature until you got to your eight o'clock primetime shows. So, you know, GI Joe wasn't particularly exciting to me. I, I think the GI Joe animated movies were dope. I really enjoyed those uh, as a kid, but um, you know, GI Joe just signaled to me, this is the last cartoon before the cartoons for the day are done. And that was kind of it for me, but seeing these two together, there was some nostalgia there. You know, I look forward to that. Um, yeah. So, Give us your thoughts. Let me know what you think and um, appreciate y'all checking out the review. As I said, I'll post the, um, you know, the the, com the uh, completed version on Patreon. I might have to mask the YouTube version after the first uh, presentation of it. But again, give me your thoughts in the comment section and uh, I will. I'll let y'all soon. Peace.